Flesh and Blood is a game that revolves around its heroes. While the individual classes are different enough from each other, each having a distinct playstyle and set of mechanics, it's the hero you select that has the biggest impact on the deck you build. Each hero has their own unique ability, and you usually want to build your deck around this ability, getting as much value out of your selected hero as possible. First introduced way back in Crucible of War, Datadoll Mark II is a young mechanologist hero that, at a glance, seems really powerful. Whenever a mechanologist item that costs two or less is banished from your deck, Data Doll automatically puts it into play. Now on the surface, this seems like a value train that has no breaks. A lot of mechanologist cards have the keyword boost, which lets you banish the top card of your deck. If the banished card was mechanologist, the card you attacked with gets go again. This keyword, combined with Data Doll's effect, in theory lets you build a deck that is both highly aggressive and quickly builds an impressive board presence. Unfortunately, Data Doll has a downside, one that cripples her ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, well, anyone. You see, Data Doll is the only hero in the game with only three intelligence, a move that, in theory, helps to balance out how aggressive her ability is. Unfortunately, having one less card in hand than everyone else is far more crippling for this robo-waifu than I think anyone at LSS anticipated. Having only three cards available means that Every move for Data Doll is far more costly than for other heroes. Blocking 3 damage with Rhinar, for instance, only eats up one fourth of your hand, but in Data Doll, you're giving up a third of your potential actions or resources. Those resources have to go further, by the way. Any cost you're paying in the Data Doll matchup is pretty heavy since you have to trade potentially one or two-thirds of your hand just to threaten three to five damage. Flesh and Blood is a value game, and little exchanges like this quickly snowball into a winning or losing situation. Data Doll has a rough chip on her shoulder thanks to her low intellect. Ironic, since in the lore, she's the mind running an entire city and as a result of her three-card hand, she has a hard time catching up in many matchups. But it's not all bad news. While Data Doll has largely been jank up until now, with the release of Bright Lights, players have a whole slew of options to help upgrade this hero and, hopefully, make her that much more viable. In this video, I'm going to be examining a selection of mechanologist cards, both old and new, that can be put to use in any Data Doll deck you want to run. And while this is more of a deck guide than a deck tech, at the end of the video, I'll be showing what I've assembled for you to check out. With all of that said and done, let's begin. First things first, since you have less resources to work with, it's important to prioritize attacks that simply don't need them. Some of the best cards available to Data Doll, after all, let you conserve what few resources you have for when you really need them. Zero cost attacks like Zero to Sixty, T Bone, and Sprocket Rocket are all a must have in this deck, and they'll make up the bread and butter of your combat. T-Bone is particularly effective since, in the right situation, it can force your opponent to block with a piece of equipment they'd really rather not use. And it's important to remember, Sprocket Rocket gets plus one from banishing an item with boost, even if that item is put into play with Data Doll, giving it a lot of synergy here. 
The Expedite is really useful in this deck since, if it hits, it can put an item from your hand into play. Handy for getting some of those items out of your hand and onto the board for free. A data Link, meanwhile, ops once when it hits, and knowing what's on top of your deck is always useful. Of course, you may find yourself wanting more firepower, and for that, there are a few Mechanologist attacks worth slotting in if you feel the need. Red Throttle costs 2 and swings for an impressive 6 damage, making it an ideal card to hide in your arsenal. A payload has the same stats, but with the added effect of getting Dominate if you boosted during the same combat chain. I shouldn't have to mention it, but you will be boosting with Datadoll a lot and often. Speaking of boost payoffs, Maximum Velocity is an absolute beast that swings for 10 damage, but can only be played if you've boosted 3 or more times that turn. Datadoll's hand size restrictions mean you'll never play this card from anywhere but the arsenal, but it can be a potential finisher if set up right. More on that later. Now, attacking is only one half of the Datadoll equation. You'll also want items to boost away to get the most out of your hero's ability. There's a lot of great items in the game to choose from, but Optical Monocle and Microprocessor are must-haves for your deck. Optical Monocle lets you opt five times with it before it leaves the board, letting you know when an item's on top of your deck for the next boost. The fact that you can use all five ops in one turn is great too, since you're not always sure what's on top after opting just once. Microprocessor, meanwhile, sticks around much longer, effectively forever, and has a whole host of useful abilities. Obviously, opting is good, but you can also draw a card and return a card from your hand to the top of the deck, potentially trading an item in your hand with an attack from your deck. Its third ability, meanwhile, lets you just straight up banish the top card of your deck, which is very useful if you know that card's an item. Now, since Datadoll really does not want to block with cards from the hand, there's a few items you want to include to help mitigate some of that damage. Dissipation Shield enters play with four Steam Counters, losing one on each of your action phases. This handy doodad can be destroyed at instant speed to prevent the next X damage, where X is the number of Steam Counters on the shield when you destroyed it. Similarly, the Red Dissolving Shield comes into play with three Steam Counters and, like the Dissipation Shield, loses one each turn. Removing a Steam Counter at instant speed lets you negate the next one damage you would take, which is handy in a pinch. The Absorption Dome is a bit less useful. It comes into play with Steam Counters equal to the number of times you've boosted that turn, and removes Steam Counters to prevent damage. Since you don't have control over when its defensive ability is used, this is a bit less ideal, but damage prevention is still good regardless. Finally, there's Dissolution Sphere, which sticks around for a turn or two and prevents damage any time you would take exactly one, which is insanely useful for certain ninja and assassin matchups. Now, while there aren't as many offensive items, there's still a few useful ones to consider. Tick-Tock Clock comes into play with a Steam Counter and loses that Steam Counter at the start of your turn, dealing one damage to you and destroying itself if you can't remove a Steam Counter from it. In exchange, this little bundle of joy destroys itself and up to two other items in play whenever a Mechanologist attack hits the enemy and then it deals damage to that enemy equal to the number of items destroyed. It's important to note that the TikTok clock does not need to blow up your own items. If you're in the Mechanologist matchup, this can be an excellent way to get rid of some of your opponent's value. The Boom Grenades also come into play with Steam Counters and lose those counters as the turns progress, and they're destroyed if they don't have any, but when you hit with a Mechanologist attack, these bad boys explode and just deal flat damage, 
four for the red, and three for the yellow, which can really make an impact. Beyond just the attack and defense items, there's some utility ones you can consider as well. A signal jammer sticks around for two turns after it hits the board. The steam counters, you know the drill by now. And it makes it so that each hero can't play more than one non-attack action card each turn. Since you're, ideally, only playing your attack cards, this can be a great way to slow down an opponent's tempo. Penetration Script has the Steam Counter rules as well, but its effect gives a flat plus one damage boost to your Mechanologist cards. Hyper Driver enters the field with some Steam Counters on them, and the first time you boost each turn that they're out, they lose a Steam Counter in exchange for giving you a free resource. Finally, the Fuel Injector is an item that can single-handedly enable this deck's finishing move. As an instant, this item puts itself on the bottom of your deck and gives you a free resource. This little guy is part of the ideal setup for threatening your opponent with maximum damage. Now before we talk about equipment, you may be wondering why I didn't discuss any of the Mechanologist block cards or some of the other utility cards available to the deck. Simply put, the block cards are kind of a trap here. Since you can't defend with cards in the arsenal unless they're defense reactions, blocks have to sit in your hand, which effectively makes them a dead draw for your turn and can seriously slow down the tempo of your deck. Similarly, while there's a lot of great utility cards available to Mechanologist, most require resources, and you want to save the few resources this deck will generate for your big swings. Now then, you're largely going to want to play Mechanologist equipment. The Viziotronic Model I is insanely useful, since it can, in theory, let you fix up any hand, and it also has Arcane Barrier, just in case you come up against some nefarious Runeblade players. But another headpiece to consider is the Crown of Providence. It's got Blade Break, sure, but it blocks for a solid two and also has a one-time Sink Below type effect, letting you put a card from your hand or arsenal on the bottom of your deck and drawing out a card to replace it. The Achilles Accelerator is pretty much always going to be your leg piece. Sure, it only blocks against arcane damage, but it can destroy itself for an action point so long as you've boosted at least once that turn, which is very useful, especially if you're trying to go for the kill. For the arm piece, there's really two options. Goliath Gauntlet can help set up your throttle, payload, or maximum velocity attacks, but the adaptive plating isn't bad in the arm slot either. Its Galvanize effect lets you destroy an item when you block with it to help stop two more damage, which is pretty good, honestly. Play whichever of these you like, though I'm more partial to the Gauntlet. As for the chest piece, look, there really is no option here. Teclo Foundry Heart is what you're going to play. It's got Battle Worn, which means it'll effectively stop three damage, and its main ability, when combined with Fuel Injector or the Hyper Driver, can potentially win you the game. With these cards, the strategy is simple. You want to boost aggressively with your zero-cost attacks, building up board presence and pressuring your opponent as much as you can. Once you've drawn Throttle, Payload, or Maximum Velocity, arsenal them. Once Fuel Injector or Hyper Driver is on the field, and you've got three zero-cost attacks at hand, it's time to go off. Boost those attacks. Use the resources from Fuel Injector or Hyper Driver to power the Teclo Heart and gain those two additional resources. Crack the gauntlets if you're using them, and swing for massive damage. For weapons, I've found it more and more often that it doesn't really matter which one you use. Plasma Barrel Shot works fine as a gun, since it gains a boost based on how many times you've boosted on the turn you shoot with it. But Hitting Fatigue is very possible with this deck, so you might want to play the Teclo Plasma Pistol. Keep in mind that there's a whole other group of items you want to play to make it efficient. Personally, I'm not too fond of shifting the deck's strategy too much to make the pistol great, but I also know that it's an extremely useful weapon, and if you want to run it, be my guest. 
Obviously, the game plan of swinging a lot and then swinging big isn't a foolproof strategy and there's a lot that can go wrong in a matchup, but Datadoll has always been a risky hero to play, janky at best and junk at worst. But I love this hero, I've loved her ever since I first laid my eyes on her, and I think if you try this deck out, you can come to love her too. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed, why not leave a like or share this video with a friend? Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell button if you want to be alerted to new videos and all that jazz. I absolutely love Datadoll. She's my favorite hero in the game, and I'm always trying out new ways to play her. If you want to see my current build, a link is in the description below, and if you have advice or tips for the deck, I'm all ears. The deck's always being improved, and I'm always taking suggestions, so if the deck list has cards that aren't in this video, don't worry. I simply either didn't know about them when I was making the video, or didn't consider them for my initial build. If you want to chat with me and others about, well, anything really, there's also a link to my Discord server down there, where we discuss games, anime, memes, and more. Finally, if you want to support the channel directly, a link to my Patreon page is also below. Patrons keep the channel healthy and going with their donations, and in turn get early access to my lore content. If you want to help me out, go check it out. Thanks again for watching, and have a great day.